Welcome everyone to our new Institute for the Humanities space. Thank you for being patient during the, our really rocky entry into this space, like with furniture all over the place and with this thing, and we're actually only half moved in because surprise, the elevator broke in Stevenson Hall, so we couldn't move anything over. So anyway, welcome. It's great to see you. I feel like we need sunglasses because there's actually light on a cloudy day. Um, I know we're all used to the basement space. Um, my name is Mark Canuel. I'm director of the Institute for the Humanities, and I'm so happy to see you here for this exciting event. Um, I would like to tell you about a couple of upcoming events. Um, the Anthropocene Lab meets here at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Um, Catherine Lofton from Religious Studies at Yale will be here um, to share her entirely new work, never delivered before, How to Build an American Religion at 12.30, right here on Thursday. Also on Thursday at 3.30 p.m., we collaborate with Gender and Women's Studies and History with a reading with John D'Amelio, who is right here with us today. Um, he will be reading from his new memoir in room 1-470 in the Daily Library. Um, and all day, on Friday from 9 a.m. or 9.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., a conference on Charles Mills's The Racial Contract will begin um, at 9.30, I already said that, um, in the Cardinal Room in um, SCE. Um, it's an all-day conference to celebrate this incredibly influential work for anyone who works on race, social contract, political theory, literature, et cetera. Charles Mills's work um, has been extremely influential, and we hope that you'll join us for that day-long series of events with scholars from all over to discuss it. Okay, so now on to today's event. It's my great, great pleasure to be introducing Margarita Saona for our first faculty fellow lecture of the year. Um, this is an extra special moment for me personally because Professor, Professor Saona and I joined the faculty at UIC at sort of the same time. You were a couple of years later and my entire career here has been enlivened by her brilliance and generosity as a scholar. The Institute itself has been enriched over the years by her participation in so many facets of its existence, from her speaking on panels at conferences, to serving on our executive committee, and of course, being a treasured faculty fellow. So when I think of the handful of people who have made our lives at UIC so bountiful with their intellect as well as their humanity, Margarita is very much in that firmament for me as well as many people who are sitting in this room. Um, and um, so it's really wonderful to be celebrating this moment. Professor Saona is a professor in the Department of Hispanic and Italian Studies, and her research focuses on medical humanities, trauma, memory, and testimonio, visual cultures, discourses on gender and Latin America, and cognition and the arts. She received her BA from the Universidad Católica del Perú and her PhD from Columbia University. She has taught, among other places, at Fordham and Columbia before joining us at UIC in 1998. She's author of numerous books and articles on Latin American literature and culture, including Memory Matters in Transitional Peru, published in 2014, and most recently, Despadre, and my translation of the subtitle, possibly wrong, is Masculinity and Identity Crisis in Peruvian Literature, sort of good, um, published in 2021. Her many articles, chapters, and reviews range over a series of theoretically rich treatments of memory, trauma, gender, and national identity with an emphasis on Latin American and specifically Peruvian culture and literature. In addition to a very distinguished career as a critic, um, um, with a transnational audience, she has received an equally enthusiastic following for her poetry and fiction, publishing short stories and poetry with her book, Tin Heart, receiving the honor of Best Poetry Award 
um, Best Book of Poetry Award from El Comercio in 2017. She has published four books of fiction to equal acclaim. She has also received an Educator of the Year Award from the Toomey Award, recognizing excellence among Peruvian immigrants in the US, as well as two teaching awards from the Council for Excellence on Teaching and Learning. This is her third Institute for the Humanities Faculty Fellowship for her project Entranced Hearts, which brings her formidable creative and critical abilities together. So please join me, join me in welcoming Professor Sayona to share it with us. Well, thanks, Mark, for your, your very generous introduction. And thanks to the Institute. And thanks for all you have done to set this up for today. I know it's not been easy. Um, so my talk is going to be a little bit different, I think, from what we are used to at the Institute. Um, I hope you bear with me. So I subtitled the talk for today, How to Write About One's Own Experience of Heart Transplantation. This is what I wrote shortly after they suggested I might need a heart transplant. Hypothetical heart. And if this heart could not handle more than my panting every time I turned the corner, if it could only afford me a life full of limits and very modest goals, would that not be still alive? Would I need to tell my heart that sadly it failed? Is it that it not love enough? Or perhaps that it always wanted to love too much? Or that it tripped itself by loving something that was not there to be loved? They say that its left ventricle barely pumps and that its myocardium is less strong muscle than a bunch of scars. But nonetheless, my heart feels, flatters, moves the blood that gives me life. And I, the one whom this heart heartens, I walk, write, read, cook, play, and love. And I don't know for sure if I would be able to climb mountains or if I could face the dark assaults of fate, but my heart goes on and so do I. And if they determine that this heart is not a good enough heart anymore, they say it would be necessary to order a new heart ready to go. The thing is that that other heart comes another life now, a life I presume full and rich, the life of someone who can climb mountains and face anything that fate brings. But for that heart to replace my failing heart, that life, that supposedly full life would have to stop. So its heart would start animating mine. And I know this would not be a cold calculated sacrifice, something planned in full awareness. This would be a heart whose life was accidentally ripped. And nonetheless, it is weird to think of that hypothetical circumstance. And I wonder how weak would my weak heart have to be for me to wish a new heart in exchange for someone else's life. There on my first poem on the topic, you can hear my discomfort expressed by what I already perceived as the transactional nature of transplantation, a life saved only because another life is lost. I knew very little about heart transplants back then, and I still don't know um, as much as I would like, but bioethical questions were very clear to me as soon as the trans transplant was an option, as an option was first mentioned. During my first heart surgery, a mitral valve replacement for a pig's valve, I had already wondered 
how much experimentation had been done over the centuries to arrive at that moment. I even asked my vegetarian daughter if she would be repulsed thinking of the pig's sacrifice to save me, when I could have chosen a mechanical valve that carried for me um, the kind of life sentence of being in an anticoagulants. I was also shocked by all the medical waste necessary to prevent sepsis in hospital settings, uh, all the discarded plastic, for example, and all the expenses invested on me. I wonder what my fate would have been had I not had job security and great insurance, or if I had been in my country, for example, in any city that was not the capital. I was conscious of my privilege. The awareness of time, dedication, and material resources devoted to me was overwhelming. In a world in which many lives do not matter enough, so much was being invested in saving mine. I have been concerned for a while with the problem of how consciousness relates to our bodies. My book, Memory Matters in Transitional Peru, explore the connection between cultural products, our senses, cognition, and the construction of social memory. Memory Matters responded um, to a preoccupation with embodied memories and subjectivities, and the experience of illness brought these problems to the fore again. Illness creates a physical and emotional estrangement when our bodies act in unusual and painful ways. Our perception of our environment, ourselves and others changes radically, as does the way in which others perceive us. Writing was for me a way to process that estrangement. Medical interventions altered my image of an autonomous body when mine depended on machines and blood or blood transfusions. After what I thought was a period of good enough recovery, I considered myself no longer in fatal danger, but I suffered a, an atrial fibrillation that caused failure in several organs and landed me in a specialized cardiac clinic on the south side of Chicago. I lost consciousness for several days and underwent a number of surgeries I still cannot recall. Others have tried to fill up uh, that blackout in my personal history. What I remember clearly was a persistent question in my mind when I woke up. What if it had been my brain and not my heart? Would I still be able to formulate that question? Would I still be me? Where does the self reside? Those questions have become, if anything, more persistent with time as I have immersed myself in the study of health humanities while trying to understand the implications of a heart transplant. There are two predominant narratives of organ transplantation, the heroic one that depicts it as a miracle and a horrific one that depicts it as an aberration. That first poem of mine showed an awareness of another side to the story offered by the surgeons. If they could save my life, why could they not save that other person's life? I did not know this at the time, but I would flatline more than once, just five months after I wrote that initial poem. I remember losing consciousness twice, once at the dojo floor after a karate class and once at the ambulance. The cardiologist who treated me at the ER of Illinois Masonic on the last day of his fellowship before moving on to a postdoc and with whom I stayed in contact told me afterwards that there were several more times when they needed to resuscitate me. He did not say this with as many words, but I could have been declared dead. But he insisted my flinch was not just a flinch and did not pronounce me dead. He could have, someone could have pronounced me dead as I flatlined. This is what my memory or perhaps my imagination has come up with 
from that experience. I assume this needs to be imaginary, although it presents to me as a memory of impossible circumstances, like talking to a nurse while they apply uh, the shocks of the defibrillator. For a reason not totally clear to me yet, this narrative, I narrate this as a short story using a third person, perhaps because the first person saw, sounds implausible even to me. Here it goes. She herself. No, it hurts. If we don't do it, you're going to die. She felt that shock of the defibrillator, that the shock of the defibrillator made her body jump several inches in the air above the gurney. And the pain, as if stricken by lightning, paralyzed her from head to toe. We should notice, of course, that such dialogue is impossible. If she was able to talk, there would be no need for a defibrillator. Nonetheless, those words sound clearly in her mind. And then nothing, almost peace. And suddenly her girls, her thoughts come back and the pain of thinking of their pain, the girls without a mother too soon. No, an abrupt clarity and the need to come around. To come around where? Had she left? Had she left herself? Whose then is this voice in her head? Who's that aching body? To come around, wake up, open her eyes, to talk to the doctors and nurses, making all that noise around her, to explain to them what happened. But she can't. Her eyes, her voice, her hands do not respond to her will. She tries again and again she fails. She recognizes the voice of the electrophysiologist who treated her months ago, the same one who thought that the danger of fatal arrhythmia had passed. He was obviously wrong. She also hears a young Romanian who was finishing his fellowship in cardiology. She sees them. She believes that she's seeing them. Somebody lifts her eyelid shines a flashlight, but apparently there's no reaction. She tries again. She forces herself to shake her body with all her might. She believes she shakes her body with all her might. In her mind, arms and legs flail violently, as if trying to knock off annoying bugs that have landed on her. She, a black belt capable of breaking one inch boards with her fist, puts all of her strength into shaking her legs with no success. She wanted to say that she was alive. She wanted to beg them not to shock her again, tell them that it hurts too much. Concentrating like she had never concentrated in her whole life, she tries to move one more time. A woman's voice says she's moving. The Romanian comes closer. She hears him say, Maria, blink. Another voice says, She's just flinching, but the intern says, Maria, blink, blink, Maria, blink. It was so weird that the medical personnel to encourage trust would call her by that first name that none of her friends would use. She concentrates in responding to his request, all of her strength trying to blink and finally her eyelids respond. She blinked, they say, and then, she feels that they know she's alive. She can let go now. She opens her eyes, everything hurts and surprised she thinks, I did not die. I did not die. What a strange thing to think. Her husband is by her side and smiles with tears in his eyes. He tells her what happened, the many surgeries, the transport to a different hospital, with an advanced heart failure center, her organs shutting down, her kidneys, the dialysis. She looks at her hands and finds a couple of balloons inflated like rubber gloves or a collection of sausages. She had not realized how much her hands were part of who she was. The back of her hands, that part of our bodies most exposed to our own eyes, even more than our faces for which we need a mirror. Our hands are what 
reveals to us who we are. But that is not what she can see now. This is different, alien, almost obscene. Several machines are keeping her alive. She cannot keep track of the days that have passed since she had collapsed at the dojo. She remembers the arrival of the ambulance, the emergency room, and now this present where time has become immeasurable, a series of intervals marked by doctor's visits and the changing of bandages. Her husband has decorated the walls of her intensive care room with photos of her loved ones and her most impressive karate demonstrations. They give character to this otherwise sterile environment, filled with machines, rhythmical beeps, and strepitous alarms. Doctors come in wearing friendly smiles and kind words. One of them points at one of the photos and says, we'll get you back to that. She smiles, or at least she tries. The nurses who change her bandages praise her strength when she holds the rails of the bed for them to clean her back. She knows they are trying to be encouraging, but her eyes fill with tears. She was strong once, but not now, vulnerable in the extreme. Her best friend visits every day. She squeezes his hand the whole time he is there. He feels offended that nurses call her sweetie and honey. To him, that is infantilizing, disrespectful. For her, those names remind her of her humanity as much as holding his hand so tightly. He might not understand that immersed in that soundtrack of beeping machines in that sterile room, any tenderness is a lifeline, a vest keeping her from sinking, a ground wire, a cable connecting her to the mothership in the desolate infinite space. What she cannot stand is hearing others use her name in the third person, incapable of raising her own voice, lost in a throat ravaged by tubes. What she cannot stand is not being able to support her own weight and the look of pity in others' eyes. In her dreams, she recovers her voice and rides her bike through sunny tree-lined streets. In her dreams, she dances and laughs with her daughters and discusses topics dear to her heart with her closest friends. When she wakes up, she wonders. She asks herself again, if she died then and now lives in a limbo, or if she's still alive, even if the others do not know she's still herself. These two pieces of creative writing I have shared with you uh, already exemplify my search for ways to talk about experiences that challenged my sense of self. My rendering of what some would call an out-of-body experience or even an episode of locked-in syndrome deals with the fact that I could have been declared dead. I could have been the one for whom resuscitation was halted. I could even have become an organ donor myself. My heart was obviously not good for anybody else, but I could have become a tissue donor of some sort. This has become more unsettling when I consider the fate of my own anonymous donor in the light of things I have read regarding transplantation. Chief among them has been Sarah Wasson's transplantation Gothic tissue transfer in literature, film, and medicine. While her insights and contributions as a literary and cultural critic are enormous, the book has opened to me a series of paths I had been trying to explore on my own and provided a rich bibliography on the history and bioethical discussions around heart transplantation. Chief among the painful revelations of this book are the inconclusive discussions around determining death. I had considered myself safe from the really gruesome scenes of organ trafficking, but had not really considered the ways in which 
a complex medical establishment constructs the symbolic representation of transplantation as a miracle and as a gift of life. However, even my uneducated self already, already felt a bit uneasy, fearing the predatory aspects involved in the process. While on the transplant list, I wrote the following poem. An available heart. Sharing the fate of the carrion bird, deny the elegance of a bird of prey, I will just sit tight and wait for the call. I know I'm not an active killer, only someone whose subsistence depends on someone else's death. We can circle around the ideas and the words. We can present it as a gift of life or as a mere twist of fate, or we can talk about a heart becoming available as if it is, um, as if it were something that arrives fresh at the store when in season. One nurse said, you know, the summer brings so many motorcycle deaths. And so I cannot not think about the actual heart. I cannot help but think that that actual heart is now beating in someone else's chest. I imagine him strong, young, risk loving, full of life. I imagine he has a mother, perhaps even a child. But for this to happen, I need to just wait until we can talk about him as an available heart. I have to say that while I formulated my uneasiness in my poetry, I did not care or perhaps I did not dare to ask how death is established for organ transplantation in our state. To be fair to the medical establishment and to myself, I am not sure of how much I would have been able to process information at the time I consented to being put on the transplant list. But from the 2020 retrospective hindsight, I wish I could have consented to receiving an organ only within certain definitions of death for my donor. My writing now veers away from poetic language um, as the scholar puts on her reading glasses. Thanks to Sarah Wasson's book, I have discovered how transplantation has been facilitated not only by the advances in medical sciences like artificial ventilation, other life support systems and immunosuppression technology, but also by the crafting of discourses and legislation that have reconfigured our understanding of death. We have new vocabulary and new legal categories that make transplantation possible, such as neurological death or uh, non-heartbeating donation or NHBD and donation after circulatory death or DCD. While there is something called the dead donor rule that requires that donors do not be killed in order to obtain their organs, there is less agreement, for example, uh, in the determination of cardiopulmonary death. I have to wonder when my heart stopped, was I dead? And I quote from Robertson. A key factor in observing the dead donor rule is the determination of death. The United States and most European countries now accept that death can be determined by tests that show irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory function or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain. The latter tests, tests for the whole brain, are necessary when the irreversible cessation of cardiopulmonary functions in a mechanically assisted patient cannot be independently established. I guess my cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions was not irreversible. It is still disturbing. Robertson adds, studies have shown residual spontaneous electroencephalographic activity in some brain dead patients. To ensure that potential brain dead donors are actually dead, 
without risking warm ischemic time that would damage the organs for donation, many programs establish protocols for NHPD. According to those protocols, life support is withdrawn already in the operating room. The recovery team waits for the cessation of respiration and of cardiac activity before pronouncing death. But the protocols are not devoid of controversies. One of the controversies is that uh, drugs provided to prevent warm ischemia, such as anticoagulants and vasodilators, could cause ac or accelerate death. The second controversy warns about pronouncing death too soon. The idea is that given more time after disconnecting life support, some patients might regain respiration and circulation. To prevent this from happening, many programs institute a two to five minute wait, but this depends on the loss of each state. Is the wait enough? Some argue that at that point, the patient could have been resuscitated. So it could have been disconnected from the machine. And if the patient did not come back um, by him or herself or themselves, um, should not they have applied a uh, defibrillator to revive them? So um, here, the ethical, so some argue that at that point, the patient could have been resuscitated. Wasn't I resuscitated after my own heart stopped? Here, the ethical medical question is if resuscitation should be attempted unless the patient or the person with power of attorney had signed a non-resuscitation order. Are the doctors letting this person die? Are they actively killing them if they administer anticoagulants? Robertson seems reassuring in his assessment of the protocols. Less reassuring is to know that the criteria to determine brain death keeps being revised. The most recent literature review and recommendation I found was pu published only two years ago by the Brain Death Project Group in the Journal of the American Medical Association. This publication presents the results gathered at the World Federation of Intensive and Critical Care Meeting in uh, 2017 in Brazil. So they agreed on this, there was kind of this world uh, meeting where they agreed on criteria only in 2017. I had my transplant at the beginning of 2017 uh, and this was only published in 2020. Without going into details, I don't fully understand the fact that there are differences in understanding brain functions and brain activity, for example, or diverging diagnosis of brain stem activity versus whole brain death is very disturbing, as is the thought of undetectable brain activity. From that terrifying scenario comes this poem, Elegy. Oh, tell me you were really gone. Tell me that you felt no pain. You, stranger skin, tell me you were not there when they saw your chest open, when they pulled out your tender heart. Was it beating? How, how, how? A gift, they said. Was it? They were waiting for you, ready to make good use of your parts, love of mine. As if you were a dispenser, a supplier, and I, a worthy patron, or oh heart of mine. This body that I am keeps growing, aging all around you, you forever young. How can I carry forward? How do I live with what cannot be undone? I can only hope from my uncertain present that it did not hurt, that you were really gone when they gave me your heart. In Transplantation Gothic, Sarah Watson devotes a chapter to the experience of organ recipients, demonstrating that there are very complex experiences that are often blurred behind the celebratory discourses around transplantation. 
the kind of language that refers to it as a great medical achievement, a miracle, a gift, tend to obscure not only the bioethical issues regarding organ procurement, but also the way recipients' lives are affected. Two qualitative studies carried out by the University of Toronto in 2014 showed that feelings of grief and bereavement appear in both pre-transplant and post-transplant patients. In the article, Getting Ready and Then Keeping Quiet, Exploring Grief and, uh, with Pre- and Post-Transplant Patients, J.M. Poole and others conclude that, and I quote, this kind of emotion known as disenfranchised grief is pain not recognized by current social and political norms. Consequently, patients may try to keep quiet, disallowing themselves the outward mourning that might be cathartic. This is a result of a culture dominated by toxic positivity, the attitude that tends to dismiss negative emotions with superficial reassurances. This is the same impulse that privileges the full recovery narrative. And even if I now try to avoid it, I have participated in it. I probably still participate in it. It was extremely ironic that on my blog on the platform Carrying Bridge, I wrote a sort of protestation of the prevalence of the stories of success without knowing that two days later I was going to fail miserably and that my life would be hanging on a thread for months, months to come. I entitled that entry on success and inspiration. This comes from my blog in Caring Bridge before the fibrillation. In the last couple of months, I have been getting a nagging, uncomfortable feeling when I am told I'm inspiring. I don't know how to say this without sounding ungrateful and unappreciative. I certainly love being loved. And feeling loved has helped me struggle through some rough patches since November. But I somehow feel undeserving, almost ashamed. I feel uncomfortable with being praised for doing what I had to do what I was able to do. It is very hard to explain. But today I found a posting in Heart Sisters, a blog on women and heart conditions that I have been following and that I highly recommend, that I think helps me understand this discomfort. It is entitled Survivor Bias when we focus only on success. The, um, the focus on success to a certain extent dismisses the experiences of those who do not succeed. And I quote, um, the world's attention is, is self-consciously diverted away from those who are not there because they are either no longer well enough or no longer alive. And this preference for the positive can also support the false belief that those who succeed must clearly possess some uniquely superior qualities. End of the quote. I really want to succeed. I want to be alive and to have many more years doing the things I love. And I love the idea of inspiring others. If my writing or my classes or my kata or my board breaking inspire people, it thrills me. But the feeling is very complex when being inspiring has to do with having the good fortune to not have died in a hotel in Marseille, to get outstanding healthcare, to have a wonderful network of family and friends supporting me. But what if? And what about those who did not have such good fortune? When I wrote that, I thought I had turned a corner, that I was uh, on my way to a slow, perhaps limited recovery, but recovery nonetheless. Two days later, everything changed. I managed to survive. Since then, I have been called a star patient, a hero, a fighter, an inspiration. I don't think that my discomfort with those terms is only survivor's guilt. I felt that they erased a large part of the embodied experience of survival. I tried to express that in a poem during the period that followed when I was carrying ventricular assistance devices in my body and on the waiting list for the transplant. I'm a survivor. 
I'm a survivor. I am not a hero. I just cling to life like any other organism, holding on to the life it's been given. If I stayed alive this far, it is because desire is stronger in me than the dubious allure of death. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm a survivor, I am not a hero. And if I look the monster in the face, it is not because I am not afraid. It is because I fear what might happen if I dare to look away. I'm a survivor, I am not a hero. And you might find me inspiring if you are also inspired by a lynx, an insect, a leaf of grass, a tree. What I am trying to do with my current project and trans hearts is to give voice to the complexity of my experiences. I want to be able to talk about my illness without resorting to the triumphal narrative of survival and happy endings. I also want to avoid dwelling on pain and hardship. I want to use language to explore the ways illness interpolates us. I want to acknowledge illness as part of life, a complicated life, a complicated part for sure, but a part that makes us reassess some of our assumptions of what it means to exist, to have a body, to conceive of ourselves as autonomous beings, to face mortality. Many times I have been asked if writing is therapeutic. I hate that question. <laughs> I believe that I just need to write and thinking of it as therapy shines an utilitarian light on something that I consider an intimate part of myself. However, I have come to terms with the question and now I recognize that there are therapeutic aspects to writing about illness. On the one hand, when my body had been completely taken over by machines after my vital organs had shut down, when I was intubated and could not speak, the mere act of writing, as soon as I could manage to hold on to a marker, a marker to an acrylic board, was like an anchoring for the self, an affirmation of my being. After the complete shipwreck of my sense of identity, writing was a way to recover some agency. On the other hand, writing, like many other activities, demands attention and thus distract us from pain and worry. It is clinically proven, a clinically proven fact that distraction can be very effective in pain management. And an activity that engages you both physically and mentally can take you away from the intensity of the pain and the pain and the, and the worry, I would say too. Writing is my language. Others might use images or music as their primary way to express what moves them. While I often appeal to the written word, I do it in different registers. I'm equally fond of the analytic language of scholarship, the musicality of poetry, and the tentative musings of the essay. At times, I also try to tell a story. When I started my blog on Caring Bridge, after my first incursion to the emergency room, people asked me why I decided to write about my experience in that form. I got the same question regarding poetry when I published Thin Heart. I had no satisfactory answers. After years of much thinking and reading, I believe I have a few ideas, even if not really fully formed. I know that at times a verse comes to mind in specific words with specific sounds, and it begs to expand from that acoustic kernel. At other times, I am intrigued by the phenomenological questions illness brings up for philosophers or by the discourses on posthumanism, um, and that appeals to the scholar in me. But at times, I just want to think through writing in free form, away from the academic jargon or I simply want to tell a story. And that is why in Trans Hearts needs to be a multi-genre text because the different facets of my experience call for different forms of expression, respond to different needs. While I have been working on this project for several years now, I still don't know what shapes it will take in the future. It still feels pretty much like an adventure 
like exploring a labyrinth or spaces that are bigger on the inside. If anything, I hope that it invites its readers to write along, that this trance might be open for each of them, might open for these, each of them different ways to understand what it means to be alive. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you so much for this um, really wonderful display of a fascinating project bringing together your different ways of writing. Um, and I actually have a question about that because um, as you were talking about what interests you conceptually about um, translocation in general, it seems so richly relational, your relation to medical professionals, the, the vocabularies of analysis from medical professionals, um, your relation to um, the source of the um, of the organ and the mourning for that you know, that's connected with that and so on and so forth. Um, but when you think of lyric poetry, it's not a genre that lends itself incredibly easily to relationality. I mean, it's, it tends often to be coming from the experiential eye. And so I was just kind of wondering for you, how you think about lyric poetry in, the, in both in connection to this problem of relationality and how it fits into this project. Um, Maybe that's not the way you could think of your lyric poetry. Right. No, it, it is. It is interesting because I think that it, it starts from the experiential eye. But I think my answer would be that since illness um, is often perceived like this breakdown of the eye, of the self, that is what helps you connect to others. Because I think that the that when you realize that you are not an autonomous being, that even like that the, the, the layer of skin that separates us from the world can be broken. Uh, that you can have machines inside, that you can have someone else's blood in you. And I think that that, that is one of the things that I'm trying to work on another a piece of writing that I've been doing. Um, so there's, I have this article about uh, Jean-Luc Nancy Lintrou and, um, and I love Nancy's essay on his own heart transplantation. Um, and I think that, that it contains this idea of the breakdown of the self um, and how this should open us to others. But I don't think that he develops that second part as much. And I try to connect that to um, Braha Ettinger's uh, concept of the matrixial as the, in, in, and kind of simplifying terribly, is the idea that, that all human beings have been, uh, have grown up in, inside a body and therefore we are connected to the other. Uh, we cannot, and, and then you can go of, other of the Jane Brook Nancy's writings on kind of self and other and community and and take it from there, right? But but so I think that that in the in the poetry that I think in my own, but also in in um, other poetry that I've been reading, um, I see this this um, kind of recognition that. Oh yeah, my body is not so great. <laughs> my body is not autonomous, and I am depending on all other things. Uh, my body is not this um, image I had in my head, and when I see myself in the mirror, I have lost all my hair. Now the birds are making nests with my hair. Um, so all sorts of things that come up in poetry of people who have experienced that kind of breakdown of the body and breakdown of the self. Yes, Ellen. I guess I, I guess I'm 
just wondering like how how all of this has changed your relationship to academia to your research you know where is the academic self like, is it those developing what Mark was saying like mm -hmm. those you know, once you know these things, you approach things differently, or those things that work for you look different. Um. Yes, and and no. Um. There are a few students here that maybe can attest to. <laughs> I don't know if there's any who are on the before and after, um, but I think that that on the one hand, I. I, I like rigorous research, you know, and I like immersing myself in reading. Um, I was telling Jeff, like somebody is trying to work on a panel for me and and one of the paragraphs that she sent me, I felt, okay, I need to study 10 years to affirm what she's saying in this paragraph. I'm not, I'm not, I cannot participate in this panel without <laughs> fixing this because this is not something that I really know about, you know? So I, I still feel like that about, um, academic or scholarly research. Um, in my teaching, I I think I I feel, I think in general, I feel more compassionate. Uh, and I also would like, um, I would like to find ways to make, to, to build bridges between things that are, um, for different audiences. And I think that, that a hard place in, in these um, pandemic times is that we don't, do not know where our students are coming from anymore. I think we never knew very well, but now it's just much worse, right? Mm -hmm. So our expectations really need to, to change. And I think that we need to, to figure out how to not abandon our search for knowledge, right? But um, build up, you know, uh, I think a, a, a word that Jeff told me is scaffolding, you know, to, to find ways of, of, of scaffolding things and, and also to find the connections with all of our lives, right? Uh, outside these rooms. Does that respond to your? <laughs> yes, Rosie. So I'm going to take it a little bit away from you, but mm -hmm. before you back me, mm -hmm. um, I was very lucky a couple of months ago to lead a presentation out on the West Campus for the kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think of one of those who has visited our Italian students several mm -hmm. times, but uh -huh. you know, here, here, here. Uh -huh. In any case, he directs that clinic, and something that what caught me, or everybody was fascinated with the machinery and their success rate, and they do the robots, they just like mm -hmm. a main team of the clinic. But the thing that caught my attention is that they have specialized on all the patients that nobody else wants. Mm -hmm. So, for example, most of these patients are rejected for mm -hmm. cancer. Right. Um, if your BMI is, I think, something above 34, mm -hmm. you're immediately not accepted into most risk. So, they well, what they've done is that they specialize in the machinery that they mm -hmm. have in having successful transplants for patients that other clinics will not take. Right. And what was very touching beyond that, you know, that this is the fact there, but mm -hmm. they, they had a long video with testimonials from the family, mm -hmm. right? And that, you know, like, I have nothing to do with the medical campus, but what kept um, coming back to me was the idea of work, you know, who is worthy yeah. of having a trans. Yes. Luckily for all of us that I knew you before and now you after, we were more than one. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's that idea of who is worthy of death and of life, of keeping alive and yeah. not keeping alive, right? But then on the recipient side, mm -hmm. who is worthy of receiving these gifts. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's just for me an interesting aspect of your experience as mm -hmm. well, and I wanted to see how you know, how you reflect, and if at all, or like in the this idea of work, right? That yes. you're worthy of this of this year. Yeah. Well, definitely. Um, and from the from the beginning, from the first 
surgery. It's like, why am I receiving all this attention? Like why, um, you know, when I know um, there are a lot of people who need so much, you know, um, a lot is being invested in saving my life, right? And that, um, that from everything, you know, the, to, to, to find out how much the surgeries cost, et cetera. But, but of course, much more when it came to the, the transplant. And when you read these things and know that people with addictions are not, um, don't, do not qualify and obese people do not qualify and this and that. And, and I, I find that horrifying that, that we are placing value, different value on different human beings, right? And so, um, yeah, that, that I kind of experience um, as kind of a, a direct beneficiary of, you know, all that has kept me alive of, you know, being educated, um, having a job, all these things, um, being relatively healthy. Uh, if I had comorbidities, you know, that are not necessarily because some people would, you know, would apply moral things to being addicted or being obese. Um, so it's so complicated, but, you know, people with diabetes, people with other, with a form of cancer might not be, um, might not qualify for uh, transplant. And so, um, yes, I, I did, um, that was, I was very aware of that. And especially when I was on the list and, and really wanting a transplant because the machines were awful. Um, yeah, at the same time thinking, okay, um, I'm giving, being, I know that they are giving me priority and why, right? And, um, but there is also, I'm not the first person to think of that. Of course, there's a lot written about that. Um, and um, yeah, I found some kind of fascinating books around the whole ethical question with transplantation. Oh, thank you. And you guys seem very thankful you're here <laughs> with us. Um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, um, a lot of this is about the question of the narrative and, you know, narratives prepare us for so much, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether they should in the way they do. And, you know, there are all kinds of questions about that. But I just sort of wondered, I, I mean, what what's happened to you is the sort of thing that, yeah, there are all sorts of narratives in place. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's such a radical event, mm -hmm. series of events. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just kind of curious what surprised you most um, about the the events themselves. Yeah, just what's been most surprised. Um, Nothing so at the at the very <laughs> beginning that it happened to me, you always think that things are not going to happen to you for some reason, right? Uh -huh. And so um, when it happened to me, it was it was not that that you know um, that it it was not the why me. It was it, it was not that because it's not that I that I think that I deserve to be preserved from sure. bad things. It's it was more um, the the you know i i'm so active i eat okay you know mostly well i think uh, i don't drink too much i don't, don't, don't do drugs i exercise um and so um when they first told me that i had a heart attack i i i laughed i this, this must be a mistake you know I called my brother, who is a doctor, and said, well, they say I had a heart attack. And the reporting is high. So yeah, that, that means you had a heart attack. And so so that was one of the things. And then and then the other thing that, that I found really surprising, and that's one of the things that I try to express in, in some of the poems, is the survival instinct that is so strong. Because um, I... I might think that I don't really care that much if I die, except for 
you know, my family responsibilities, say, but, 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 but then your body just reacts in ways that, that, that I found surprising. And, and it, it's really weird when doctors say, you've been unconscious for four days or whatever. And the doctors come and say, you're a fighter. I'm not a fighter. I'm kind of in the bed and tied with tubes. I'm not doing anything consciously, right? Um, so what does being a fighter mean? So I think that those are things that, that kind of, that I don't know, just kind of made me marvel about our, the connection between us, our bodies, our brains, and our sense of self. Liliana and then Sarah and then Tatiana. Follow-up question on that, mm -hmm. and that has to do with uh, you talked about you know the breakup of the cell, and I was wondering what what space does this instinct of survival occupy within our cell, right? Mm -hmm. Do we have a representation of ourselves? The cell does it include the instinct of survival uh, in addition to the consciousness about the you know bioethical mm -hmm. issues and how. Is there a tension between those two things, or do they coexist uh, in a in a similar way? I mean, it's just you know, right. Whatever you think you think. Yeah, about. yeah. I think that's a, a big question. <laughs> yeah. um, what does the self want, or what what is the self, right? Is it also the and that wants to survive, and the other, you know, evolved self is thinking about all the other conditions. Maybe exactly. You know, I'm I'm fascinating by by um, neurobiology, and I I wish I knew more, but I don't really, and I don't know um, how much you know people like if if there are studies about people who say they want to die, but then they you know keep keep going in in circumstances where their bodies are seriously compromised. So it's it's very hard to to tell and and that that memory or pseudo memory that i have that i wrote this story about that is, is when i'm receiving these electroshocks and and, and thinking I, I don't know it's it's really hard for me to to talk about this when i when i make literature of it it's it's fine but it's like Almost every sentence that I say, I feel that I need to qualify it. But okay, just bear with me. I, <laughs> so I remember, you know, being unconscious and in pain, and, and saying this is too much. I need to let go, and then thinking that I want, I don't want to die because my daughters need me, right? And and of course, I I love my daughters, but I think that if I was a childless person, I would find, have found something else that I needed to live for. A book, my parents, my friend, a political cause, whatever, right? So I think that, there, that, that in my look or sound as, uh, as kind of the rational part of my brain making that decision, but I don't think that's true. That, that's kind of the, the instinct that I have. Sarah? Um, Talking about a process of putting this into literature, I mm -hmm. that causes struggle mm -hmm. and making clear that it's not mm -hmm. qualified. And um, grappling with defining yourself in all of this, and, and Michelle said, you are in all of this as a multilingual. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you think actively or talk about the relationship between translingualism, translation, mm -hmm. and transplantation as you work in different languages and then even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> and I think that the that that in kind of naming the the book um, in Spanish, I called it "Corazón en Trance," with with actually means kind of in a trance. Um, but that is used in in a song from the 80s or 90s that I really like as if it were transit. And so kind of the combination of those two things. And the fact that that of course there is the, the literally the literal change of the organ, but 
but also the fact that the heart changes, is in transit, keeps changing, um, and the the problem of the term transplant in itself and how it and and I found people who write about about this beautifully too. Um, the fact the fact that it uses a kind of botanical metaphor and but the process like when you of transplantation is not the same at all. Like when you transplant your roses, you know, you you know move the whole plant, right? You don't take a part of it that and the rest dies and you put that part in another one. And uh, and even um, grafting, right? Uh, that is also used in transplantation um, and how that also comes from uh, the, um, botanical uh, terms, right? Um, and and so maybe maybe some like some transplants like a kidney transplant could be more like grafting, but grafting is also used for a heart transplant. I don't know. It's kind of um, very very complicated in in that term. And and then all the one of the things that I found that that poets who write about um, illness do is um, analyzing. Uh, lexicon, right? So the, the I know the metaphors. You know? Uh, we could say that I'm a Peruvian transplant in Chicago, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So and 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 the what makes you realize uh, or what what makes you kind of fixate on on the this the the, the poetic possibilities perhaps of words is in part alienation, right? It's that, that you're you're facing the word in a context that you don't know or you're learning new words, right? Mm -hmm. So that has for me another layer because English is my, my second language. And, and that was, and in the book of poems uh, that is a bilingual book, I explained that, that I wrote some poems in English and I wrote some poems in Spanish. And lots of times with the English poems, was that I was wondering what some words, um, the use of some words, right? Like, like what, why failure in heart failure, for example, right? Um, and I know um, that uh, blogger that I talked about, the one of um, Heart Sisters, um, writes extensively about how she she hates that word, failure in heart failure. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think that that yes, being bilingual adds to this uh, distancing from the word. Tatiana, then John. Um, while listening to you, how obviously the conceptual is project and it speaks to so many levels. Um, I was listening to the silence of the room as I was listening to you. And there was a sense that you were really speaking about something that you just don't talk about um, in this field, right? With the university, which has to do with this kind of human condition, mm -hmm. um, not disciplinary, but their life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you were also talking about how your work is more now it's in the field of uh, medical humanities. So there is this sense that, you know, there is always this neat academic category <laughs> that in one way or another, we, we need to fit. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, now in both of these categories, the word humanity is present, right? Between humanities and between speaking to our humanity, right? So um, how do you see these two? versions of humanity, right? The humanity version and the just the kind of the, the this living um version or uh, living and dying version of humanity. Well I think that we are in the Institute of the Humanities, and I wonder if we are going to change the name in the future, <laughs> or or are we, if, if you know, twenty years from now, perhaps we will call it somebody something else, um, because um, I 
I think the, the, the terms medical and humanities, health humanities are also, we're just grasping on something for a practice that is trying to, to break the disciplinary boundaries. And it's not easy. I have been lucky enough to connect with people mostly abroad, mostly in um, the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and, and these are kind of, there are, there are a lot in, in the uh, places in the States that do it too. And we have health humanities here at UIC too. But, but a lot of these places are isolated. And so um, one of the weird things of, the, uh, of, of being isolated during the pandemia was the, the fact that you know, more things are recorded, there are more Zoom um, uh, presentations, more Zoom activities, seminars. So I was able to connect with a lot of people who are trying to do these things. And, and what I think is uh, very help, helpful is when people from um, the health sciences present an interest in poetry, storytelling, narration, philosophy, um, images, um, etc. Um, I think that that you know from this side of the campus, many of us try, but sometimes it's we don't. It's not received on the other side, right? Uh, in I remember a conference on memory when um, there was a psychologist who worked on cognition, and during his presentation, he would say things like. Well, I'm going to say it like this so you can understand it, right? <laughs> so, and, and so still people who position themselves in the hard sciences um, do not see the connections to these other things that we do. At the same time, I think that uh, one of the things I wrote about is about being a cyborg and so uh, if you see Haraway, Raidioti, and all these uh, philosophers who are um, trying to question, you know, the centrality of, of the human in the universe. And I think that that, that for me also, um, this experience of the breakdown of the body and on the self uh, has been a, a path to, to reconsider some of these issues. Um, you know, thank you for all this um, fascinating and, and I, I think I'm interested. Um, I, I think my question started when you made the move from the personal and creative uh, part when you were talking about uh, you know, the kind of symbolic discourse and how sometimes they can become overly schematized and kind of either heroic or triumphal narrative. And 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 but then also what where you ended up kind of encouraging your readers to to that so we also have a platform where they need to be alive. And my question, I think that the, in a way has to do with you know that, that today there are so many kind of discussions and debates about the limits or ethics of a writer or an actor you know, portraying individuals from a community that that they're not part of. Mm -hmm. tend to be more racial or gender orientation. And so I, I guess I'm curious of how you engage with creative representation of, of illness, not, not even necessarily specifically transplanting uh, from, from those questions. But, but I think specifically I'm kind of interested in the fact that so much of your own work is, is not just personal, but, but creative and, and imaginary, it's sometimes, you know, you find yourself not just asking the question about representation in DC, but also as you're engaging in the representation. So there's sometimes kind of, if you have if you ever, if the imagination doesn't go too far, you think, if you have to kind of rein back or, I don't know that. My imagination? Uh, oh, I don't know. If so, so if, if we're talking, I shouldn't go this far oh. as I'm kind of reconstructing lost memory from the imagination. Just oh. that, I think. Not, not when I'm writing. And when I, re and when I read other 
I read or watch, you know, representations of, of heart transplantation, um, a lot depends on the quality of the work, <laughs> right? Um, there, are, there are beautiful books and I don't know if the authors had an experience or, or, or knew somebody had an experience or not. And I, that doesn't really affect me. And then there are some things that are just kind of, there is a, a, a Colombian uh, show on Netflix right now. I don't remember the name, but it's something very flashy. And it's kind of this um, kind of organ trafficking. But of course, what happens is that the woman who received the heart of the, of the wife, of the guy, uh, ends up falling in love with him. And yeah, so, so you know so <laughs> so a plot that is a bad plot is a bad plot regardless of <laughs> who writes it right so so i don't know if that responds to your, <laughs> to your question right well actually um yeah a lot of of um the work that I did, like I started following Braha Ettinger after I had um, Julian, uh, Julian Gutierrez Alvilla present on Todo Sobre Mi Madre uh, uh, using Ettinger. And I was very curious. Um, and I think that um, the work, like the, the bioethical questions in Almodovar are all fascinating, you know, all of them, like the changes of face, um, the, there are so many things like, uh, there's a lot on, on disability in his movies. Um, there is a lot on, um, and, and kind of sometimes violations of, of bodies, right? So, so I think it's, it's just so rich and, and wonderful to explore um, that I don't see, um, I, I don't see kind of the, if, if what you're asking me is if I have kind of, if I feel that there should be kind of identity. Um, I'm that, but mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah. I think yeah. Yes, Jan. Thank you so much, Jan. There's actually more about brain that's Definitely, yeah, yeah. I I was since I heard about Russian formalism when I was twenty or whatever. You know, um, I was fascinated with with it, and and obviously this made it um, a lot more clear, and so. One of the things that I've written um, was um, uh, a paper on on poetry um, by by people who are sick, and and I there I play with the idea of of the aesthetic of illness, mm -hmm. and and I play with the with the idea of anesthesia, and the idea of using aesthetic as as what is perceived with the senses, which is not really the, the sense in which we use it currently, but in its origins, it had that relationship, right? the, the aesthesis, as can, what can be perceived. And so, um, yes, there, there is definitely um, a lot of, of that. Um, <laughs> I'm not a scholar, and um, but I do observe that there's always been a conflict between science and um, one's under social understanding of life, when life begins, death, when death begins, mm -hmm. the right to die, the right mm -hmm. to be born, and. Mm -hmm. The advances of science have always been a source of stress. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we can certainly see it now mm -hmm. regarding abortion. 
in terms of the ability to breathe life. Yep, exactly. Human. Yep. Um, and so, and it seems that philosophy and art mm -hmm. have always been the, the vehicles to save us from despair mm -hmm. um, as these huge social issues of when life begins, who has the right to die when, what is that? Mm -hmm. And I see there's fields of science, fields of uh, academia that are all addressing this mm -hmm. as these questions are whirling mm -hmm. socially and politically. Do you have hope <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that, that I, I do see that I don't I don't have the, the technical understanding to understand how our your your question us, is perfect <laughs> saving us mm -hmm. from these uh, dramatic conflicts, but do you think that um, that um, the medical emphasis that you've been researching and uh, addressing that are looking at the different categories of death, for example, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think they'll have the resources, the political freedoms to really address and 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 research and you know because things are so politically affected now. What who gets funded? Right. And, I mean, yeah. So because it is such a move, I seems to be mm -hmm. even this medical um, technology that's now available and available like the the kidney mm -hmm. available to mm -hmm. more and more right. people with different medical um, histories. Do you? Do you do you think that this field will progress and that we'll, we'll have access to these? Um, I don't know really what I'm asking. Oh, that's a perfect question. And yeah, and actually, that's that's why I am trying to, to establish these connections. And that's why I'm trying to, like, if I can devote the rest of my career, you know, so there is human rights issues and that issue, the issue of of trying to to develop languages in which we um those of us who who like language and art um can communicate with people who have the the knowledge and the technical um know-how right mm -hmm. and um but but it's that's very interesting because my my class on on um on uh, literature and, and medicine started with with that fact the the fact that that the the one of the problem of, of visualization actually in medicine is that it has done away with a lot of the clinical exchange right mm -hmm. and so uh, well not just you know, not just the visual te te tests but other kinds of tests too um, that that medical professionals will look at test results and not much at um, the patient, right? Mm -hmm. And but there are important developments. There are, and and I don't know. I hope they last. I hope they grow. I hope that so, so right now Columbia University offers um, this narrative medicine masters. Um, both for uh, people in pre-med and people um, just from other uh, disciplines. Um, and the the idea is that that people in the health professions need to to pay attention to story, right? Um, and another uh, workshop that I attended that was beautiful was um, works with um, medical students. Uh, and take them to museums and they show them paintings and they ask them what they see. And, um, but the trick there is to, um, to not let them um, make assumptions or kind of um, to just say you know, specifically what is in in this image and if they say something like um there's a sad person there they will say well how do you know that person is sad um so that they it forces uh, some levels of observation that are mm -hmm. important right 
And so I think that there are initiatives like that. Of course, they are a minority, of course, probably not well-funded, but I want to be hopeful. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing that I need to solve this year. <laughs> um, I, I'm working with a lot of the, of the blog for the third time because I wrote the blog, they, and I, I wrote it in English and I translated it to Spanish. Uh, I compiled it and now I'm kind of looking at it again. And what I'm doing is um, kind of interspersing parts of the blog with, with poems or little essays. And, and there are things that I have been writing in these five years that I'm trying to see how I will incorporate so that things flow. I want to, to keep some of the, the kind of the narrative arc or, you know, of my story. Um, and sometimes it's even hard for me to keep track of it because, it, and, and so part of what I'm doing is taking out things that, that are just trivial parts of the blog, you know, and, and trying to, to put things that, that where I do kind of a comments above or beyond or a little bit kind of just using this other voice. And, and then I also incorporate poems and then just brief um, essays on the word diagnosis or uh, on being a cyborg or things like that. But I want to, so I want I want it to be something that people want to read, and not and not just because because they are curious about heart transplantation, right? Um, uh, there are I found several memoirs that I felt were just poorly written or kind of or or not particularly interesting for somebody who's not related to the person. <laughs> so. Um, Obviously, that's not what I want to do. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you.